Welcome to lecture number two in multiple antenna communications at Linköping University. I will start today by talking about the taxonomy of point-to-point -point channels. So that is when we are transmitting from one point to another point, from a transmitter to a receiver. And the basic setup that we considered in the previous video was the point-to-point -point SISO channel, where SISO stands for a single input, single output. So that is when we have one transmit antenna and one receive antenna. And in multiple antenna communication, there are several other setups that we will consider. In this video, we will talk about the point-to-point -point SIMO channel, which stands for single input, multiple output. So we have one transmit antenna and multiple receive antennas. Then we will turn the system around and consider the case when we have multiple transmit antennas and one receive antenna. And that is something that we call a point-to-point -point MISO channel, where MISO stands for multiple input, single output. And then finally we have the point-to-point -point MIMO channel with multiple antennas at both the transmitter and the receiver. And that is a case that is deserving its own lecture. So the inputs here are the antennas that we are transmitting from, and the outputs are the antennas where we are making our observations. The outline of the lecture will be as follows. First, I will start with a recap of the size to capacity results that we talked about in the previous lecture. And then we will extend these results to the capacity of a SIMO and a MISO channel. After that, we will look at channel models for a line of sight channels and wrap up with talking about the beam width of the signals transmitted from a uniform linear array. The first thing I would like to point out is that not all of the power that we're transmitting gets received. Actually, it's only a very, very small fraction of it. So from an omnidirectional antenna, the power is spreading out as a sphere. So it lives on the surface area of a sphere and the sphere becomes larger and larger. And when we are observing a signal at distance D, then if the antenna that we are receiving with have a omnidirectional behavior as well, then the fraction of the power that we'll be observing is lambda, which is the wavelength to the power of 2, divided by 4 pi d squared. And therefore our system setup is like we're sending a signal at time l, we send signal x, we have a channel response g, and then we add noise to it, nl, and the received signal is yl equal to g times xl plus nl. So this is the additive white gauss noise channel with this channel response. And typically in cellular communication, this channel gain, which is when we take the channel response and take its absolute value square, it has a value which is around minus 70 decibel to minus 130 decibel or something like that in cellular communications. So 70 dB or 130 dB, something around those numbers are getting lost along the way. So if we are receiving one out of one billion parts, then that is a fairly good number, actually. And I call this channel gain here. This is also known as the path loss. And the important thing to remember is that sometimes people are describing path loss with the minus sign in front of the decibel, and sometimes they are considering without a minus sign. Uh, you should know that, of course, the path loss must be a very small number. So uh, it's not so hard to know if it should be a plus or minus sign. It should always be a minus sign in the end since we are losing something along the way. So the capacity of a SISO channel that we considered last time when we were receiving a signal which is G times X, which was the information signal plus noise. In those cases, X of L was complex Gaussian with having power Q and N of L had a Gaussian distribution with N naught as its variance. And Q is equal to total power divided by the bandwidth. And we call this a memoryless channel because if you look at this equation here, it only depends on the time index L, and no other time index, not anything that is further back in time or the future. So this is a memoryless channel where we can consider an arbitrary point in time. So the capacity computation is that the received signal g times x is going to be complex Gaussian having q times absolute value square of it, g as its variance and therefore the capacity 
in the size of case is log 2 or 1 plus the received signal power q times absolute value square of g divided by n0 and this is measured in bits per complex sample if you multiply with the bandwidth b in front we get the capacity in bits per second instead so we should remember this result and move on to look at more complicated cases with multiple antennas and the main question here is that this ratio here is a signal to noise ratio or received SNA. And how can we increase it? Well, that is where the role of multiple antennas comes in. So here is the single input, multiple output or SIMA channel, where we are still transmitting only one signal, X, but the signal is going over different channels here to different receive antennas. So we have M and receive antennas. To the first one, we get G1, times x plus noise that we call n1 and that is giving us y1 and the noise here for all of the antennas is complex Gaussian with tyramine and variance n0 just as before. From the same transmit antenna the signal is also going to the second receive antenna then x is multiplied with g2 we add noise n2 and we are getting y2 as a received signal. And then it goes on like that, all the way down to the mth antenna, where we get x times gm plus nm, which is noise, and that gives us ym, the received signal. And all these noise terms are assumed to be independent of each other because they are created within the receiver because electrons are moving around there and creating this kind of thermal noise. So we can represent all of this using vectors. So y1 was g1 times x plus n1, and ym is gm times x plus nm. And if we are observing now that this is a vector with all of the m received signals, here is a vector representing all of the m channel coefficients, and here is the noise coefficients. Then we can write this in short form as y in boldface because it's a vector, equal to g times x, where only g is in bold phase because that is the vector while x is the scalar, plus n in bold phase because that is the vector with the noise. And we will call g the channel vector. And looking now at this received signal vector in the m-dimensional vector space, here I'm showing it just in two dimensions, we should remember that the received signal y is a summation of two parts the desired signal, which was g times x, and the noise vector n. So if n is a random vector pointing in a particular direction, and when you have something that's a complex Gaussian distributed, it can point in any direction with equal probability. And then g points in one direction, and g times x is pointing in the same direction, but it's scaled by x. And in this case, I have just illustrated it as if the vector is getting longer, but it could also be a shorter one. Then the summation of n and g x is giving us the green vector here, that's y. However, we would like now to turn y into an estimate of x. So we'd like to figure out what the signal x is. We don't care about what n is, but we are observing that n is sort of distorting the signal from us. So somehow, from y, which is a vector, we would like to get an estimate of x back. So somehow we would like to project y onto something that is a scalar value, and in that way get a guess of what x can be. And what we should bear in mind here is that only one part of y, the one pointing in the same direction as g, can contain the desired signal. The rest of it will point orthogonally to g and therefore not contain any information. So if you see here on the n vector, a component of it is pointing in the same direction as g, and another component is pointing orthogonally, and that means that only the part of n that is pointing in the same direction as g will be the one affecting the signal. So what this means is that we would like to take y and project it onto g to get rid of the noise that is pointing in entirely different directions. And that is done using something called maximum ratio combining, where you take y and you multiply it with g permission. So this is an inner product between g and y. And we have normalized g by its norm here, so that this is a length one vector. In this case, if you now take the inner product between g and g permission that is normalized, what we'll 
be appearing here is just a norm of G, if you simplify the expression. And then you get an inner product between this norm one version of G and N. And here we have the reason for why we're normalizing, because this will now be a complex Gaussian distribution, have zero mean and N not as its variance because of this length one vector. So what we are effectively doing is that we take Y, we project it down to the direction where G is pointing. And now we won't get exactly GX, we will get something else, another point down here, but it still says that we are somewhere along this line here and that we now have a perturbation of X that is only dependent of the noise pointing in that particular direction. And that is why we also from this term here is not getting a larger variance than a one dimensional one, even if we have M times N not as a total variance of the noise from the beginning. So we will now call this vector here, G divided by its norm, the combining vector, because we're taking our received observations over M antennas and we combine them together into something that is helpful for us when it comes to receiving the uh, information signal X. And now it's multiplied with the scalar, the norm of G. So this is actually like a size channel, the cases we had before. Before we call the channel response G, and in this case our counterpart is the norm of the channel vector G. So in the same way we now know the capacity. We had the power Q, we had N naught, and we had absolute value square of G. In our case, G is the norm of the channel vector, and we should square that to get this expression. So the capacity of the Simon channel is C is equal to log two of one plus Q multiplied with the square norm of the channel vector divided by N naught. And this one will now take each of the elements in G take the absolute value square of them and sum it up. That is what the squared norm of vector is doing. So it's very similar to what we had before, where we had the absolute value square of only one channel element, but now we have it for all of the M elements that we are summing up. Then we can move on to the multiple input single output channel, or MISO. In this case, we have turned around the situation. We still use M to be the number of transmit antennas. So we have antenna one, two, down to M. And for each one of them, we need to send a signal. We call it X1, X2, down to XM. And the signal that we're sending, getting multiplied with different channel coefficients, G1, G2, down to GM. And these are supposed to be the same as before, because we are just turning around who is transmitting and who is receiving. So then there is something called a channel reciprocity that says that the channel response along the way should be the same in both directions. However, what is different is that we have only one receive antenna. So the signal coming from this M antennas is gonna be add up in the air, and then we also get the noise added. And we only have one noise variable here, but still have variance and not. So the received signal is a scalar Y, and what we are getting is G1 times X1 plus G2 times X2 and in the end GM times XM and we add all of those up. So this is like a inner product between this vector with X and this vector with the G values. So we take the channel vector G the same as before, we take the transpose of it and we multiply it with the vector X of transmitted signals and then we add the noise to it. Even if we are sending a vector signal X that has M dimensions, we can't send an M dimensional information signal to the receiver because it only observes a one dimensional signal. So for that reason, we are applying something that is called pre-coding, where X is a vector that we will call W, multiply with the scalar information signal X tilde. So W is a unit norm pre-coding vector and the information signal, X tilde, have a complex Gaussian distribution, that is what is needed to achieve the capacity, and it has the variance Q. And that means that all the signal power is in X tilde, while this unit norm requirement on the pre vector is telling us how the Q amount of power is divided over the different antennas. So even if we have M antennas, we are not using more power than before.
The channel is creating this inner product between x and g, or and actually it's between x and g conjugate because an inner product is always written as a vector multiplied with the conjugate transpose of another vector, so that conjugate is missing here. That means that everything that we put into x that is pointing in another direction than g conjugate will just disappear along the way due to this inner product. So if we are transmitting using a pre-coding vector pointing in another direction than g conjugate, then if we take a projection of g conjugate on to w, it's only this shorter version of the pre-coding vector that is effective. So we are losing power. So for that reason, maximum ratio transmission, meaning that w is equal to g conjugate divided by the norm to have a unit norm vector, that is the optimal way of communicating because every other way of selecting w will spread out power in the wrong directions and that will just disappear along the way. If we are inserting this maximum ratio transmission into the expression that we had before, where the received signal y was g transpose times x, and x now is w being this maximum ratio transmission, and then we have the information signal x tilde plus the noise n, then if you compute this expression here, it will turn out to be the squared norm of g divided by the norm of g, so we just get the norm of g times x tilde plus n. And this is once again something that looks just like a SISO channel. So we have the norm of g as the channel response, we have x tilde as the signal, and we have scalar noise. So we know that the capacity of something like this is going to be log 2 or 1 plus a signal to noise ratio containing the power q of x tilde, the channel response in absolute value square, so we get the squared norm of the channel vector, and then we get the variance and not of the uh, noise here. So this is the capacity, see, in the bits per complex sample. And once again, we can multiply with the bandwidth in front to get the capacity in bits per second. So what we have considered now is the capacity of the SIMO and MISO channels. And we have considered receive combining and transmit precoding. And these things are also known as receive and transmit beam forming. And uh, actually, the expression that we got was exactly the same in both cases. This was log 2 or 1 plus q square norm of the channel vector g divided by n0. And we achieve it by what we call beam forming along the channel vector g. So when we are receiving things, we take an inner product with g, and we are normalizing it so that we are not scaling up the noise and that's what we call maximum ratio combining. And when we are transmitting, we are getting this inner product between the pre-coding vector and G conjugate, and therefore we do beam forming along G conjugate. In the expression, the important thing that comes from having multiple antennas is the squared norm of the channel vector. G, which is summation of the absolute value squares of M terms, so it's always proportional to M, and that is what we call the beam form again. The same noise ratio gets m times larger than if we only had one antenna. And there is many different names of these concepts because people have been considering these ideas for many tenths of years. So instead of maximum ratio combining and maximum ratio transmission that I was talking about earlier, it has also been called conjugate beam forming when you're transmitting or match filtering when you're receiving because you are using the conjugate of the channel G and you are matching your receiver to the channel. And here is also one reason why we're calling it transmit beam forming, because when we are transmitting from one location towards another direction, we get a signal beam focused towards that direction. And this is particularly the case when we are transmitting in line of sight towards the user here, so this particular angle towards the user that we would like the signal to go. And this directivity that you're observing here, the signal is directively transmitted in a particular direction, that is a illustration of the beam forming gain. And it's also called array gain or power gain. So there's a number of different terminologies for the same concept here as well. I mentioned line of sight communication 
And that is the setup when the transmitter and the receiver sees each other. So there is a direct path between them of a particular length and we can use this expression that I talked about earlier, the lambda square divided by 4 pi d square and put in the distance in order to compute the channel gain between the transmitter and the receiver. And here we have a setup with m different receiver antennas and in particular we talk about free space line of sight communication when there is only the direct path and no other paths. And this is a particular nice setup to study in detail because we can derive an expression of the channel vector g in a convenient way. And that is what we will do now to figure out how the channel capacity is behaving in this type of line of sight cases. The complex baseband representation of the signal that we are communicating, SB of t, contains a real part and a imaginary part. SI of t and SQ of t. And the real part, SI of t, or in phase part, that one is real value baseband signal having bandwidth b over 2. And SQ of t, the quadrature part, is also having b over 2 as its bandwidth and it's also real valued. And the real valued passband signal that we are sending based on this complex baseband signal is that we are taking SI of t. We multiply it with square root of 2 times cosine of 2 pi fct, where fc is the carrier frequency, which is assumed to be much larger than the bandwidth of the signal. And then we take minus sq of t, multiply with square root of 2 sine 2 pi fct, and these cosine and sine are used in order to modulate the signal up to the carrier frequency, and the square roots are selected such that these ones have a power 1. And one can show that an equivalent way of describing this real value passband signal is to take the complex baseband signal SB of t, multiply it with square root of 2 and with a complex exponential e to the power of j 2 pi fct. So it's the same argument as in the sine and the cosine. And then we take the real part of this one. Then we are getting these two terms. I take the opportunity to define the wavelength lambda, which is the speed of light c divided by the carrier frequency fc, because this is something that will appear in our expressions later on. And the complex baseband representation can also be shown using the Fourier transforms. So if the complex baseband representation have this Fourier transform in the baseband, then the real valued passband signal have this shape and we see that this is not a symmetric signal around the origin, that is why it's complex, while this signal that we're sending is real valued because it's symmetric around the origin. Let's now focus on a SIMA system with one transmit antenna and multiple receive antennas. And we are considering a particular shape of them called a uniform linear array or ULA. So that means that the receive antennas are all located on a line and that is what is mean with linear array and uniform means that we have the same spacing between the antennas and that is something that we call delta here. And we can define phi to be the so-called angle of arrival of the signal and we place it on the first antenna which is some kind of reference antenna. And this is the angle towards the transmitter and if the transmitter have angle zero, so it's right in front of it here, then we say that this is the broadside direction. And if the transmitter is rotated so it's up here or underneath, then we are in the end phi direction. And that is when phi is pi over 2 or minus pi over 2. And in general, the distance between the transmitter and the different receive antennas can be different. What is now the impact that the channel will have on our transmitted signal? Well, we are sending the signal S of t, which is containing the baseband signal S B of t, where our information is located. And this is signal S of t, but since the signal needs to propagate over the channel, it will be received in a time-delayed way. The received signal at antenna M, which is located at distance dm from the transmitter, is this mu M of t. It contains two parts. 
S of t minus dm divided by c. This is the time delayed version of the transmitted signal. So we, it has propagated over distance dm with speed of light. So this is a time delay. And then since the signal energy is spreading out, we are having a loss of power, the path loss or channel gain. And this is the square root of that channel gain because we are still working in the amplitude. And we have lambda divided by 4 pi dm. So this is aligned with what I talked about in the beginning of this lecture. And if we replace s of t with the expression from above, we are getting this expression. So we get a time delayed version of the baseband signal and the time delayed version of this complex exponential. And what the receiver can do is to adjust its sampling time so that it is taking this time delay into consideration. So you can sample to compensate for it. However, since the signal gets received at a different receiver has at slightly different times, it can't compensate for all of them. It needs to sample at the same time on all the different antennas. So we can choose one antenna that has perfect sampling so that there is no time delay, but we can't do it for all the antennas. So let's use this antenna number one as our reference antenna again. We can use that principle in order to compute the channel vector g, but let's make one more approximation to simplify, namely the far field approximation, which is saying that a transmitter is very far from the receiver as compared to the length of the receiver. So maybe we have a 100 meter transmitter to receiver, but only a one meter long array or much shorter than that. And that means that the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is approximately the same. Another way that people like to illustrate it is that the transmitter is sending out a signal that is spreading out as a sphere, but when you observe it further and further away, it almost looks like a planar wavefront is approaching the receiver, and therefore the distance is approximately the same to all the antennas. So when it comes to computing this channel gain, which is lambda square divided by 4 pi dm square, then dm is approximately the same for all the antennas. So we can approximate the channel gain as being constant and let d be the distance that we have to all of these different antennas. In particular, it's the distance to the first antenna. So this approximation applies to the channel gain, but the distances we're also showing up at two other places within this signal here. We had the real part of something that contained the complex baseband signal, and we have this complex exponential. And we have t minus dm at both places. And if we're now selecting our sampling time based on the first receive antenna, then t will be d1 divided by c, or just d divided by c, if d was the reference distance to the first antenna. Then if we are considering a so-called narrowband transmission where the signals are not varying very quickly, then this one is not affected by the small sampling variations. However, this complex exponential is affected by small timing variations in when we're taking our samples, because we get the distance multiplied with the carrier frequency divided by the speed of light, and that is the distance divided by the wavelength, and the wavelength is rather small. Say that it's uh, one centimeter or 10 centimeters, then in those cases, just the small variations in where we are taking our samples can matter in terms of creating phase shift. That is something that we need to take into consideration when writing up our channel vector. And using some trigonometry, we can figure out that if the signal is coming in with this angle phi, then at the nth antenna, it has propagated an additional distance m minus 1 times the antenna distance, delta, times the sine of phi. So from this argument we can get the channel vector for a uniform linear array. So we have m antennas in the receiver, we have a signal coming in from angle phi, we have the wavelength lambda, the distance between the antennas in the ULA is delta, and the distance from the transmitter to the first antenna is d. The channel vector g is lambda divided by 4 pi d. Then we have a vector with m elements. At the first antenna, which is the reference antenna, we just have a one here because there is no phase shift when we are sampling perfectly at that one. 
And then we have e to the power of minus j2 pi delta sine of phi divided by lambda. And then it increases the factor in front of this one for each antenna. So we have factor two, a factor three, and then we have factor m minus one. So we have a channel vector in the line of sight case, which has the same factor in front of the vector. And then each element have unit modulus or absolute value one. And it contains these different phase shifts for the different antennas. And this model was something that we derived for a SIMA channel, but it applies also to Meister channels because of this reciprocity of the channels in different directions that we talked about before. So if we're now considering the channel capacity of a free space line of sight channel, then we recall that this was the expression for the channel capacity of a SIMA or Meister channel. In our case, the square norm of G is gonna be having M elements because they have the same value, all of them, and the square norm, we call it beta, and beta is then lambda squared divided by four pi d squared. We put this expression into the capacity. We replace squared norm of g with beta and m. And here we see clearly the beam forming gain proportional to m. If we only would have one antenna, we will have still the beta, but we will not have an m here, we have a one. So we have a beam forming gain proportional to m. Let's now consider a MISO setup when we are transmitting towards a receiver in a particular angular direction, phi. Then we will achieve this beam forming gain proportional to m at the desired location of the receiver or actually in this angular direction towards the receiver. But there's also other places where we can see a beam forming gain. And that is something that we'll illustrate now by talking about the beam width. So say that we are sending a signal in the direction zero so phi is equal to zero. Then here are what we observe as the signal strength in other directions. And we're only considering the beam forming gain. So the difference between what we are getting here with multiple antennas, in this case, m equal to 10 antennas, and what we would have gotten with just one transmit antenna. We can see that around the direction where we're transmitting, we are getting a beam forming gain. It's equal to 10 because we have 10 antennas and it's written in dB scale, but 10 dB is still equal to 10. So that is where we're getting amplification. And then there is other angular directions close to where we are transmitting, where we also see a beam forming gain. And when we are above zero dB, we are actually getting a stronger signal that is received as compared to having a signal term transmission. This graph here is generated for the case when the antenna spacing in the uniform linear array is equal to the wavelength divided by two, which is a typical value. And the reason that we can get amplification in certain directions is that we are having much weaker signals in other directions. So this is showing that we have a beam in one direction and then we have what we call side lobes pointing in a direction, but they're still much weaker than we would be getting with single antenna transmission. The beam width is a metric that is describing how wide this main beam is. And it can be defined in different ways. One way is to consider everything that is above zero dB. So that's where we actually get an amplification compared to having one transmit antenna. We can also consider the half power beam width, which is when we're considering the maximum point and those that are half of that or larger. So that is also considering from zero down three dB to seven dB. And then there is also what we call the first null beam width, which is considering where is the two nulls here? And what is the angle interval here? And even if that definition is considering a larger interval than the other two definitions, we are still able to compute it in a nicer way. In this case, it's approximately four divided with the number of antennas. And that shows us that the more antennas we have, the narrower the main beam is gonna be. So that is showing why we are getting better performance with more antennas. So here is a comparison of that. We have either the blue curve with 10 antennas or the red curve with 20 antennas. And what happens when we are going up to 20 antennas is that the maximum beam forming gain is going up by three decibels and the main beam is shrinking. So it's almost only half of it and then we also get more ripples like this. So we can say that there are two main benefits of beamforming. One is that we get the strong signal at the desired location and slightly around it, 
And the other benefit is that we are getting a narrower beam, which means that there is less interference leaking uh, directions. So that can be also a positive thing if you would like to communicate with multiple users at the same time. So that brings us to the end of lecture 2 in multiple antenna communications.